Let's stand together now and let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. On Sunday morning, we're in a summer series entitled Encouragements from uh, the book of 2 uh, Corinthians. And we pick things up this morning in uh, chapter 2, looking specifically at verses 14 through 16, but we'll pick the context up in verse 12. Paul writes, by the Spirit of God, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and uh, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord that I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother but taking my leave of them that is those in Troas I departed from Macedonia now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other we are the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful that as we turn to your word that we don't do it alone. We do it in communion with you and your Holy Spirit present within us. And we want to study this passage and to do it connected with you, communing with you, as a part of our relationship with you. And so help us as we take these great truths from your word and, and the desire that they would be given a living, working, daily place within our lives and processing life. And we pray for this work of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In this passage uh, of Scripture, the Apostle Paul uh, celebrates fully the fact that God always leads us to triumph in Christ. God always leads us to triumph in Christ. And when you just stop and think about that promise, that reality, that truth, um, it's mind-boggling uh, when you stop and give it some attention and allow your, our minds to get uh, around it. I mean, imagine uh, God always leads us in triumph in Christ. And it's true of every single Christian uh, who's ever existed or is, exists today. Now, as, as is so often the case in this letter to uh, of 2 Corinthians, the spiritual encouragements that the, the Apostle Paul fills this book with, including this one, they pour forth from the Apostle Paul as a result of a personal experience in his life, and uh, usually from a difficult experience in his life from which he learned something or he relearned something uh, uh, and these truths that he shared. The circumstances from which this great truth poured forth from Paul's life is very, very uh, interesting and it's very, very important to understand. I don't think anyone will even scratch the surface of enjoying the beauty of what is found in verses 14 through 16 without understanding the context that is given to us as well here. And, and Paul gives us that, that, that context and uh, the circumstances. Paul had written a very, very corrective letter to the church in Corinth. And it, not referring to the letter of 1 Corinthians, which is a very, very exhortive letter uh, in, its, in its own right. But there was a second letter, a letter that is lost to us. In fact, it's known as the lost letter. A second of three letters that Paul wrote there to uh, the church that he wrote in between what we know as First and Second Corinthians. What he wrote to them needed to be written, but apparently it was very, very strong uh, medicine, and especially in putting one particular uh, very, very proud, very arrogant, very self-seeking uh, uh, individual and leader in that church uh, in his place. And somehow this man had uh, wronged Paul in some significant way, 
and he did so in such a way that represent, now made, him, uh, made uh, Paul realize that he represented a great danger to the church there uh, in, in Corinth. And uh, he probably attacked Paul. Uh, it was publicly, public to be sure, but an attack upon his personhood, upon him as a human being, but also an attack upon his apostolic authority. Corinth was a very, very proud city. It was a very, very wealthy uh, city. It was given to uh, elevating uh, s- uh, form over substance, very much like our, uh, our culture. And as a result of that, I mean, shockingly, there were those within the church uh, who, far from uh, respecting Paul, as a result of all of the sufferings that he went through in order to be faithful to God's calling upon uh, his life, they considered those sufferings in Paul's life to be marks of a lack of God's favor upon Paul's life, uh, proof that he wasn't qualified to have an apostolic and a pastoral position or authority uh, in the church, and as a result, Paul then called on the church to take action against this individual and in doing so to demonstrate their innocence related to uh, the actions of this man uh, to indicate that they had not been involved and to express their affection for Paul. Paul did not want to uh, come to the church at Corinth again if Uh, this situation wasn't resolved here um, if this man uh, maintained his position and influence of hostility against uh, against him. And so the letter had gone out. Paul didn't know what the church would do with the letter and uh, whether they would side with this man in opposition to Paul and side with him in, in his mistreatment of Paul Uh, or then side with Paul and continue to allow his apostolic and pastoral influence uh, in their lives and within the church. And so the man was splitting the church, but only the church could decide what they were going to do uh, with it. But for Paul, what hung in the balance for him was the potential that they would choose to break the relationship off with him Uh, entirely and cut him off from all of these people that he loved so dearly uh, because God had used him to establish the church uh, there um, in in Corinth. His uncertainty and his anxiety over what they would choose to do, over the possibility that they might very well make a wrong decision and side with this man, uh, the anxiety that this produced within Paul and uncertainty is reflected earlier in this very same chapter and throughout the letter. If you notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 4, Paul said, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears that you should not be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have abundantly for you. He would write a, write a little bit <clears throat> later with even greater uh, clarity and revelation in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, for indeed when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were tears. And so clearly Paul did not know where this situation was going to land, and it seemed entirely possible to him that he might be defeated here uh, in all of it. Paul then <clears throat> speaks about his ministry in Troas in verses 12 and 13. And so why, waiting for all of this to kind of shake out in the church uh, in Corinth, Paul left the city of Ephesus. He then uh, traveled uh, to a city of Troas. Each of those cities are in what we know as modern day uh, Turkey and it appears that he had made arrangements with a young protege of his by the name of Timothy, that Timothy would then travel to Corinth in order to gauge the response of the church at Corinth to the letter that Paul had written uh, uh, to them 
find out how it had been received, and then bring that news to Paul in Troas. And so Paul's not going to waste time in Troas. He begins to preach the gospel. God's hand is with him in a powerful way. People begin to come to know uh, the, uh, the Lord there. Uh, a powerful thing is, is going on there. Great fruit is occurring, as he writes about it there in verse 12. But all the way, uh, all the while in verse 13, uh, he tells us that he had no rest in his spirit. And there was a reason that he didn't have any rest in his spirit, and he tells us that reason. Again in verse 13, he said, because I did not find Titus my brother. So here he is doing the one thing he loved to do most in life, to preach the gospel, to disciple Christians there in Troas. And yet without a word from Titus about the condition Uh, of the attitude of the church in Corinth toward him, he was restless. He couldn't, he was in Troas, he was working in Troas, but he couldn't break his thoughts free of the situation in Corinth in order to concentrate fully on the work in Troas. His heart was uh, filled with, in his own words, affliction, anguish, and fear. And we don't oftentimes think about Paul in terms of affliction, anguish, and fear. We kind of think that if he pulled his robe back, he'd be wearing a cape of some kind and, uh, and think of him almost as superhuman. But this is the situation. Uh, that he finds himself in the physical impact, the mental, the emotional, and spiritual impact that all of this was having upon him. And surely as he is in Troas, and he's there day after day and week after week, and still no Titus bringing a report, your mind starts to work on it, and it must mean that the news is bad there in Corinth, and Paul is, and and Titus is delayed in coming to him because he's having to fix somehow the great mess that the letter has created uh, in the city. And clearly Paul's very distressed about all of this because he had a very, very deep heart uh, commitment to that uh, church. Excuse me. And so in verse 13, He took leave of the work in Troas, and he departed from Macedonia, where apparently he had kind of a prearranged agreement with Titus, that if Titus did not come to see him in Troas before winter, when most of the shipping lanes and means of transportation for people as well would be shut down, that Paul would then travel to Macedonia and meet with Titus uh, there. And at this point in time, Paul is in a very, very uh, difficult place, uh, again, physically, uh, emotionally, and, and mentally. He can't go back to Corinth. He can't unwrite uh, the letter. He can't move forward in his ministry and minister really anywhere wholeheartedly as his mind is consumed with. He's distracted at this situation. And humanly speaking, it looks like he's lost the battle, that Satan has won, that this situation has finally done to him, brought a defeat to him, that stonings never brought into his life, that beatings never brought into his life, that every manner of deprivation that he had run into had never brought into his life. And it's later in chapter 7 that we learn the rest of the story of Titus then ultimately coming to Paul in Macedonia, informing him of the church's commitment to their relationship with him and his leadership. Again in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, for indeed when we came, uh, chapter 7, verse 5 through 7, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. And nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, not only by his coming, but also by the consideration with which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. And then Paul further rejoiced that they repented 
of their wrongdoing as a church and partaking in this in any level and the lessons that they had learned from this, all of the good that had come uh, out of it. Half of what most of us learn uh, from the mistakes in our lives, probably a lot more than that in, in my life. And so he wrote to them again in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourself, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you prove yourself to be clear in this matter. And it was all of that, all of those circumstances, I mean, the, the, the deep emotional and spiritual depths represented in all of this, that by the Holy Spirit birthed now this celebration of God's triumph in our life in Christ as it's recorded there in verses 14 through 16. This great note of praise, God always leads us in triumph in Christ. I think it's an interesting thing about a lot of Christians, maybe most Christians and perhaps all Christians. We all know that ultimately God wins globally. We know ultimately that he even wins on a cosmic level, on a universal level, that all of this ends up in a new heaven and in a new earth, that God is going to have the final say in all of creation and in all of human history. And we have perhaps uh, heard the saying and used it ourselves where someone might say, I've read the end of the book, speaking of the book of Revelation, and God wins. And that is very, very helpful. When you read a thriller or a uh, a mystery uh, book, it is very helpful in terms of peace and a lack of anxiety to know the end of the story while you're navigating the story. And then knowing the end of human history and that God wins certainly makes navigating all of the mysteries of uh, uh, life and all of the ups and downs in life presently and uh, in a calmer, more peaceful way. And so to argue from the, the greater to the lesser, if God wins, on a global level, if God wins ultimately on a universal level, and we absolutely believe that, then it only makes sense that he will always win on the level of an individual Christian's life. But we also know that as silly and as illogical as it is, that sometimes it's easier uh, easier for us to believe this about the whole world and the universe than it is to believe it about our own individual lives. And so we believe and we will boldly say, I've read the end of the book and God wins of the universe, of the world, but we're a lot more hesitant to boldly declare in our own lives, especially in a time of trial and and battle, I've read the book and God is going to lead me in triumph in Christ in this situation. And yet that is exactly what God wants us to believe about our personal lives and to believe it with the same boldness, that on a personal level, God always leads us in triumph in Christ. This situation will end in triumph, it will end in God's triumph, always and in every place. And in this passage, the Holy Spirit provides us with several important truths that are important to understand when we find ourselves in trials like Paul found himself in. 
trials that are especially marked uh, and fill us with anguish, uh, uh, emotional and mental distress and pain, anxiety, fear, and the sense of uh, uncertainty. And Paul says the first thing that we need to know in trials like this in situations that we're all going to run into in verse 14 is that God always leads us to triumph in Christ. And the imagery that Paul was provoking in the minds of his readers, both then and now, was that of a Roman triumph. And a Roman triumph by far was the single greatest spectacle in the ancient world within the Roman Empire. You can take the Super Bowl, you can take the Final Four, you can take the World Series, the NBA Finals, and whatever is the equivalent in, in uh, academia or in uh, entertainment or whatever it might be, the great events, and roll them all into one ball, and they would not approach what a Roman triumph was when it was celebrated uh, in the capital of the Roman Empire in the city of uh, Rome. A Roman triumph was conferred upon a victorious general upon his return from a successful war in which he had uh, was allowed, uh, following that successful war, allowed a magnificent entrance into the capital city of Rome. And uh, commentator William Barclay, whose forte is uh, historical background, he provides a, a valuable encapsulation of the event. The requirements for that kind of an honor were very, very steep. Uh, not just any victory would qualify a general for a triumph, only an extraordinary general. Having achieved an extraordinary uh, victory could qualify. He had to have been the actual commander in the field at the time of the victory. The victory had to be complete. In other words, it had to result in a complete pacification of the conquered territory to such a degree that the Roman forces could then be brought out of that territory and peace be uh, maintained. The victory had to be uh, 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 complete there and a, a minimum of 5,000 of the enemy must have fallen in a single engagement. The victory must have resulted in a positive uh, territorial gain for the uh, Roman uh, Empire and, uh, and those were the requirements. The spectacle of the triumphal parade itself uh, as it would make its way through the city, enter in on one end of the city, wind its way through all of the streets and ultimately uh, finding itself at the Capitol building there uh, in the city of Rome. At the front of the parade would be all of the political officials within the Roman uh, Empire stationed there within Rome. There would also be the, the entirety of, of the Roman uh, Senate. Then there would come the trumpeters. That would be followed then by all of the material spoils of war. And those wagons could go on for miles in the distance as uh, the treasure and the loot and the booty would be taken from these conquered lands and then brought into Rome to show uh, the, the greatness of, uh, of the victory. And then uh, the parade and the triumphal parade would be followed by paintings and models of the cities that had been conquered and displayed on, uh, on chariots. Remember, people didn't have a travel channel. They, couldn't, uh, they didn't have these cities where they could look and have a picture of a city. So they would make great models of the cities that had been conquered and paintings of them so people could see uh, the, the greatness of, uh, uh, of uh, the countries and the cities that had been conquered. And then in chains would come the kings and the nobles and the generals uh, of the conquered territory, as well as the captured soldiers. Many of them would immediately find themselves slain at the end of uh, this triumphal entry. 
and, uh, and then, uh, but some of them would live because they would then be made gladiators or put in the floor of the Colosseum to be killed by gladiators or by uh, wild animals in order to provide entertainment for the people in, in the Colosseum. After which then came the musicians, and then the priests would come swinging their censers uh, with a sweet-smelling incense that would then uh, go off and, and fill the crowd on either side of the streets and, and the, the length of the parade. Then came the general himself. He would be standing in a chariot pulled by four horses. That was the equivalent of a muscle car uh, in, the, in the ancient world. And then after him would be, uh, his family would uh, ride in chariots. And then finally came the general's conquering army. And they would be wearing all of their medals. They would be wearing all of their military decorations and, and garlands. And they would be shouting, uh, hooray for the triumph in, in Latin. And then in the midst of the city, every inch of the sides of the streets would be uh, covered by crowds. And, and they would build stands in all kinds of places for more people uh, to witness all of it as, they, uh, would, uh, as this uh, end, uh, triumph would make its way through the city and all of them cheering the triumph. One Roman triumphal uh, procession uh, lasted for three days. Uh, to give you the sense of the scale and the scope of this thing. It wasn't over in 20 minutes. It wasn't over in half an hour. Or it wasn't over in an hour or six hours. These were massive, massive events. We're told that when Pompey, the general, uh, Roman general Pompey, triumphed over Africa, that he had his chariot uh, drawn by elephants. You get this sense of the exotic with, uh, uh, concerning it. Mark Anthony had his chariot drawn by lions. I think I'd watch from a window um, somewhere along uh, the route. And we certainly shouldn't see Paul's reference to the Roman triumph here as an endorsement of uh, any or all of, of this, but it was the closest thing he could reference in human experience at the time, the Roman celebration of invincibility to communicate the utter invincibility of God in human history, whether having to do with the heavens or having to do with the earth or having to do with an individual Christian that whatever battle in our lives, whatever that may look like at the moment, it will end in victory, in triumph for us as Christians. And it is worth underlining in verse 14, not only the word triumph, but to underline the words, the two phrases made up of three words, uh, always and in every place. And personalize that as Paul would intend in the Holy Spirit as well, concerning our own circumstances this morning. And here it's important to notice a couple of qualifiers, lest we misunderstand what Paul is saying here. He tells us that this triumph is in Christ. In other words, this promise is made to Christians. And it also assumes that we are following his leadership, that we are following his lordship in our lives, in the battles of life. I don't want to in any way diminish the, the full force of what Paul is saying here, but it would be a mistake for someone who is deliberately backslidden as a Christian to claim this promise and assume that God will bless their life of disobedience. Additionally, it would be a mistake for me to think that this means that God is going to bless every harebrained idea that comes into my mind. And there are plenty uh, of them, and, uh, and that he's going to bless it, uh, especially when those ideas might very well be outside of God's will for my life. But as we choose to love him and obey him, this is to be our confidence. God is going to win here. He is going to have the final say in this situation and there will be no other final say. Also, just one word about that word triumph. Uh, 
We also have to be careful not to assume that what we consider to be a triumph in a given situation is what God considers to be a triumph in that same uh, situation as well. Our definition of triumph in our situations and God's definition of triumph in those situations can be two very different things. One of the most famous verses in the Bible is Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 28, where Paul writes and he says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purposes. And so he does, he works all things together for good in our lives. But never forget that there's a verse 29 that follows, that verse uh, 28. And it is in verse 29 that Paul defines good for us. He doesn't leave it to us to define. He defines it for us in the promise. And in verse 29, he goes on to say, for whom he foreknew, speaking of the Lord, he also predestined, and then here's the good, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so the good is that we, uh, it will be used to conform us into the image of Christ to develop his character within our lives. But these qualifiers don't in any way diminish the promises of all of this here uh, in the mind of a, a spiritually minded uh, Christian. Because to be in God's will, whatever the circumstances, and to be conformed into the image of Jesus is the highest definition uh, of good for them and, and for us. And so Paul wants us to know that God will always and in every place lead us into triumph as Christians. Now the second thing that he brings out here, and I want you to know I've invested the largest portion of my time in the first thing, and the, the, the two and three will be relatively brief, to give some of you hope um, <laughs> at this point. Second, he leads us to triumph in Christ, uh, a, 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 as he leads us to triumph in Christ, that through us, he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Now remember again with the Roman triumph that you would have these priests that would come along and they would have their censers filled with incense and that fragrance would go all over in every direction and literally fill not only the streets but the uh, in, entire uh, city as they would wave it out in the entire length of, of the triumph. And the incense was a fragrance. It was a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, uh, scent. And so Paul uses the same in imagery to communicate that when God leads us into triumph and victory, in the face of every obstacle, in the face of, of every enemy, in the face of every battle, it makes him known uh, in this world. His power, his wisdom, his beauty, these things are made known to a watching world as he brings that triumph into our life, situation by situation. And as our lives, uh, and uh, our lives as Christians are never so closely watched by an unsaved world as when we find ourselves in the kind of difficulty that Paul found himself in. That kind of a, of a deep, uh, deep trial, that kind of a, the greatness of a, of a battle. And imagine that the Roman general, he is uh, poised to enter into the decisive battle for Rome, maybe in Spain, maybe in uh, Gaul, maybe in North Africa. And all of the crowds are back home in Rome and they know this battle is an impending battle. This is the information that they've got. They're aware the conflict is going to occur. They're on the edge of the seat, their seats because the Roman Empire and even their place in Rome will hinge on, on the victory. And then uh, word comes back from the battlefield uh, that the, the battle has resulted in victory for Rome. 
and the ensuing glorification of the commanding general and his army. And in the same way, as we are publicly identified as Christians, our lives are watched, people wonder what's going to be the outcome of this trial in their life. Are they going to make it through this, uh, this situation? Uh, what is going to be the outcome of this great battle in their lives? And then when God produces his inevitable victory in our lives, it diffuses the fragrance of God's existence then into the unsaved world. The fragrance of his power, the fragrance of his love, the fragrance of his wisdom. And it is one of the ways that God makes himself known to the world and Paul rejoiced in that. The Greek word for knowledge there, and I know it's very late in the sermon to talk about Greek, but the Greek word there for knowledge is the word gnosko, and it speaks of a knowledge that we don't get by book learning, but knowledge that we gain in life by uh, experience. In other words, Paul is saying that when people see this work of victory, this triumph of God in our lives, their knowledge of God will become more than just the words that we have told them, but they, it will then become something that they have witnessed themselves in our lives. And then finally, uh, the third thing to keep in mind as Paul would lay them out here in the midst of such trials, he tells us that we are to God the fragrance of Christ. That as Christians, as we allow ourselves to be used by God in this way, to diffuse the fragrance of Jesus into the world in this very sacrificial way, and then pointing to people to God as a result, that it brings pleasure to God, that it blesses Him, that it pleases Him. And as we'll see in a moment, not everyone is pleased with this. But it doesn't matter how people uh, view it supremely, it is how does it impact the heart of God? Does it bring Him pleasure? Does it bless Him? And Paul lets us know that it is. We are to God the fragrance uh, of Christ. Paul then declares and speaks of uh, the responses that the world will have to this work of God within our lives, this fragrance that is upon our, our lives, our lives so thoroughly identified with God, identified with the gospel, identified with the kingdom uh, of, of God. And they'll respond one of two ways to God's triumphal work within, within our lives. And the one response he tells us there in verse 15 Uh, is the fragrance of such a life will be an aroma leading to life in some people. The fragrance of such a life will be the aroma of death leading to death in other people. Now that, that raises an interesting question, and that is, at least it does for me, and that is how is it that the same fragrance the fragrance of God in our lives can produce two entirely different responses in people. I'm used to things either smelling good or bad. And yet here you have a fragrance that some smell and say it's good and a blessing, and others smell the same fragrance and they consider it to be a a, a stench. And again, we go back to the Roman triumph. And as the priests burned the incense during that procession, to those in the procession, not the audience, for those that were in the procession who were on the victorious side of the general's victory, the incense was a sweet fragrance because, uh, because of, uh, uh, the, the victory ensured their life. It was the means by which they had lived through the battle. And then to those in the procession who had been defeated and became prisoners of war as a result of the general's victory, the fragrance spelled their doom. 
And in the same way, the knowledge of God the Father and of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of the gospel, is a sweet-smelling fragrance to those who are aligned with God and aligned with His kingdom and in line with His victory, but it is a stench to those who reject Him and choose a life of rebellion against Him instead. God's ultimate victory in human history is not in doubt. It it will never be in doubt. That is going to occur. The only thing that is in play in the world today, presently, is which side of that victory individual people choose to find themselves on. And yet for all of the rejection and all of the hardship that can sometimes be our portion as Christians in, in, in this world, where there is the opposition to God and so much not wanting to do with God the Father or the Bible and, and, uh, and the truth of the Bible and in this current battle for people's souls, as discouraging as that can be at times, at the end of the age, our joy will be infinitely greater than the victorious soldiers who were in that Roman triumphal procession behind their uh, general and to be identified in that day as being a part of God's kingdom and as a part of his victory. And that's why Paul closes this section as he does in verse 16 by saying, for who is sufficient for these things? And of course, the idea is that none of this happens in and of ourselves, that only God is sufficient to produce this within our lives. But there's more meaning to it as well. And the Apostle Paul is communicating that for all of the trials, all of the difficulties, all of the rejection involved in being on God's side in the world presently, he said concerning himself, don't feel sorry for me. It is my honor and my privilege to live such a life. And so it is. And so this morning in our series, Encouragements from the book of 2 Corinthians, here we have Paul calling on us to join him in a celebration of the fact that God always leads us in triumph in Christ. There are battles There are always going to be battles this side of glory, but we never need to wonder about how it's going to end. Not in terms of human history alone, but in terms of every individual battle we face as Christians, that it ends in triumph. I cannot, as I endeavor to go through the Rolodex of my mind and through the memory of my mind, I cannot think of a single time in my life that he did not ultimately triumph in his word and promises in the situation that I found myself in and almost always triumph in a far better way than I thought the, the, the form of the triumph might take. And you think about what a bold, confident way this is to, uh, to live. God always leads us in triumph in Christ. I would never presume it myself. I would never believe that God would be that intimate and that uh, intimate in his power related to uh, our lives. But here it is in the scripture, God wants us to know this and believe this about our lives as Christians and to say of every trial and circumstance in life, the situation will end in triumph, it will end in God's triumph, and it will end in God's triumph always and in every place. That is an astonishing passage of Scripture and encouragement in our lives. And it's more than an encouragement. It is the absolute truth of God's promise to each and every one of us. If you sit here this morning and you are not yet a Christian, it's important for you to realize that as you look at this passage that we're looking at, uh, 
There's only two groups of people that smell the fragrance of Christ. There aren't three. There are only uh, those that are uh, either for God or those that are against God. There's no third group. And the consequences of being on the right side or the wrong side of God are immense because they are eternal. To be on the right side and the wrong side of Rome in a triumphal entry had massive significance. What side of that victory I found myself on. But those consequences, as great as they were, were merely a temporal and merely physical. Being on the right side of Christ and his victory, those consequences are eternal. And so the importance of looking and believing God's assessment of our lives as being sinners, who could argue against the fact that each of us have been less than perfect in our lives? And that God, at the end of our search, we would discover to be so perfect that but one sin in my life would separate me from a relationship with him. Who would want a God that was less holy than that? And yet a God that loved you and loved me enough to send his son to die on the cross as the full and satisfying payment for the forgiveness of our sins, and only he is and then work all day, every day in our life to try and bumper car us to a place in life where we will finally look at that Savior and surrender ourselves to Him. And that's what God wants each of us to do, to come to that place where we say, I believe He is the victor, and I want to be on the right side of that victory by trusting in Him and making him my Lord and my Savior. And if you've never done that, there are going to be pastors and other men and women up front immediately after the service, and they'd love to answer your questions and pray with you to begin that relationship with God that you've been created for this morning. And if you need prayer for anything in your life this morning, they'd love to pray with you and for you as well. Let's stand together now and we'll close in prayer. Father, what a marvel it is to have experienced the truth of your triumph in our life in Christ over and over and over and over again. In circumstances like Paul's and other circumstances as well, it always ends in triumph. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we pray for ourselves and we pray for one another in the midst of whatever trials or difficulties or decisions or actions of others like what happened with Paul, whatever's happening materially or relationally, all of the things that can put us in a place of fear and anxiety. I pray that you would use this great promise of yours, this great thing that uh, you want to have be our confidence and that you would insert that into every bit of anxiety and fear and worry within our lives. And we praise you, and Lord, we confess ahead of time that even in these situations that you will triumph. Thank you for giving us that kind of confidence in which to navigate this fallen world and in which to live our Christian lives. And we thank you in the name of the one who has made that possible. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.